Hi everyone, can you hear me? Professor, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Your audio is good now. Uh, yeah. Subramanian sir. Uh, Subramanian sir. Right. Am I audible? Ah, yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yeah, if my voice is uh, loud enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Better you can uh, keep your mic very close. Oh, oh, okay. So means you suggest that I should uh, use the microphone. Can you make it louder? Uh, your audio. Is it better now? Uh, but uh, I can hear, I, I'm hearing echo. Now it is, is it fine? Uh, yeah. But it's still the echo is there. Yeah, still is the echo is there. Maybe, maybe that uh, other mics we have to off.
Sanju ma'am, shall we yes. start? Yes, 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 sir. Sir, my voice is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good morning, one and all present here. On the behalf of SRM Institute of Science and Technology and Department of Physics. I welcome you all to fifth day of the faculty de development program on advanced computation and experimental research in physics. At this occasion, I would like to introduce my institute to you all. SRM Institute of Science and Technology is one of the top ranking institutes in the India with over 38,000 students and more than 2,600 faculties across the campus offering a wide range of undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral programs in engineering, medicine, and health science, and science and humanities. The institute has academic tie-up with leading corner universities like MIT, University of California, University of Oxford. Our institute is accredited by National Assessment and Accreditation Council, the AP plus plus grade in 2018 and get placed uh, in A category by Ministry of Human Resource and the Development. Now I would like to invite Dr. K. Subramaniam, Assistant Professor, Department of Physics to, wel to welcome the gathering and introduce our guest. Sir. Yes. Ma'am, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Good morning, one and all present here. I welcome Dr. Neil Broderick, Professor, Department of Physics in the University of Auckland, New Zealand, to the two-week international faculty development program on advanced computational and experimental research in physics for day five, session six. It's my privilege to welcome you all the participants from various institutions, research institutes, the research scholars for this program. I would like to introduce uh, uh, the today's speaker, Dr. Neil Roderick. He's a professor in Department of Physics, the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Dr. Neil received his PhD in the year of 1996 and joined the Department of Physics in the year of the 2011 as an associate professor. His research area includes fiber lasers, nonlinear optics, photonic crystal fibers, optical sensors, micro matching. Dr. Neil is an expert on the generation propagation of light in optical fibers and its applications. He has worked on the fiber lasers, amplifiers, and pulse shaping for micro matching. This work means that he is a member of the photon factory leading the fiber micro activities. His activities span the range between studying the fundamental mechanisms behind mode locking to the applications of such as systems in music. He is he's act, active in developing fiber sensors for geophysics applications and in particular looking at the Alpine Fault on the South Island. He has published more than 20 papers in the repeated journals. Professor, really we are fortunate to hear your lecture today. Welcome, Professor. Now you take your session. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, so, thank you, everyone. I feel very honoured um, and privileged to be invited to um, talk. Um, I certainly also appreciate it because I know how hard it is to travel at the moment. So it's great having these opportunities to talk science with um, people from overseas. Um, and so I would like to thank the organizers for this. I've been looking at the program and um, it's been a very impressive range of speakers um, that you've managed to line up. So it's um, congratulations to the organizers there. Um, they deserve it well. So um, I'm going to start my talk. Um, so as, as we said, my talk um, is about nonlinear optics. And in particular, 
it's the approach we take um, at Auckland within the what we call the um, dynamical systems group. So this is a large collaboration between physics and mathematics. Um, and it's sort of blurring the line between applied maths, pure maths and um, experimental optics. Um, and because it is a large group, um, it's not something I can do all by myself. So I really do need to highlight um, all the co-workers. So in mathematics, um, the group is led by Professor Bern Krauskopf. Um, and then we have a very talented group of postdocs working for us, uh, Sojik, um, who now is a lecturer in France, Stéphane Rochelle, um, who recently just joined us from Germany, Angus Geraldo, who's from um, Colombia, um, and Bruno Garvin, who was originally from France, um, and he's now moved back there. And then we have a current crop of PhD students, Robert, who's from Ghana, Rodriguez, who's from Cameroon, Ravinda, who's from Sri Lanka. So we're a, you know, highly multinational group. Um, and then we do a lot of work with collaborators in Paris. Um, so this is the Centre for Nanoscience and Nanotechnologies. And their main collaborators are Ariel Levinson, Alejandro Yakamoti, Sylvain Barbe, um, and they have a number of PhD students and postdocs who have been working on these projects over the last um, four or five years as well. So the outline is to give a brief introduction to dynamical systems, and then I'm going to try and explain how it works um, by applying it to four different physical models where we've got some nice experimental results. So Q-switch fiber lasers, semiconductor lasers, um, coupled nonlinear passive res resonators and photonic crystal cavities. So when we talk about a dynamical system, um, generally you think about something that's moving and then what we're interested in is the range of outputs. So if you think about a fiber laser, well, obviously the fiber laser can be on or off, right? So that's two states. But also when the laser's on, it can pulse, right? It can have relaxation oscillations. It can have Q switching. It can behave chaotically. All right, so each one of these different modes of behavior um, are what we're interested in. And the dynamical system approach sort of looks at the boundaries between the different behaviors, right? So there's a, generally, there's what we call a bifurcation point, right? Where the laser changes from one state to the other. And the advantage of doing a sort of bifurcation or dynamical systems analysis is that it allows you to see the universal features, right? So if you understand how a particular set of say chaotic behavior occurs in one model, in one laser, you can understand how the chaos appears in different sorts of lasers. And I'm gonna hopefully um, show this by looking at a variety of simple models. So the first model we're looking at is what's called the Yamada model, which is a model for a um, semiconductor or a lay single mode laser with a saturable absorber. And in its simplest form, it's just a set of three um, ordinary differential equations. There's one equation for the gain, which is G. There's one equation for the saturable loss, which is denoted by Q. And there's a equation for the intensity of light, All right? Um, this, this intensity of light one is just the simplest. It says that the rate of change of the intensity is just G minus the gain minus the loss. And then we normalize it with one times the intensity, as you would expect. Um, and then these, Lasers become nonlinear 
because of the gain coupling term. So there's this factor G times I here, there's a factor Q times I, um, and we pump them. So you can think of A um, as being the pump, the laser pump, pump current. B is the relaxation current for the um, semi-susceptible loss. And the time is normalized so that, you know, there's some natural loss in the system. Um, so in the absence of anything else, did G by dt equals minus G. And so the population inversion for your laser would just decay exponentially. So if you're given a set of differential equations like this, and you're asked to analyze them, the very first thing you want to do is find the points, um, the fixed points. So this is where dg by dt equals zero, dq by dt equals zero, and di by dt equals zero, right? So these are points where the output doesn't change in time. Um, and that's just ends up solving three simultaneous equations for g, q, and i. Um, and you find there are generally three fixed points. The simplest one is that i equals zero, right? If i equals zero, di by dt equals zero, and g and q are uncoupled, right? Um, and this is what we call the off state for the laser, all right? And then there are lasing states where i is non-zero, um, like that. So. The very first transition you might talk about in the Yamada model is this transition. As you increase the pump current or A, you have the off state here. And at some point, suddenly, you get the appearance of a lasing state, right? Um, and this occurs when A is greater than one plus B, all right? And this would be the output power here, all right? Um, and again, this is a nice simple model of a laser, right? Where you get a um, threshold at which lasing starts, right? And because there's no spontaneous emission in our model, this threshold is at a non zero pump current. So the next thing you can then ask is whether or not these lasing states are stable or unstable. Um, and also what sorts of instabilities there might be in the system. And if you do that, um, we can sort of split our parameter plane um, up into uh, multiple regions separated by different traject different lines, curves, right? So down here, um, non-teaching faculties of Department of IT and our beloved students. I am pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. K. Vengatraman, who is a technical yeah, lead company, uh, working in the Cognizant Technology of Solutions, Chennai. Now I request Dr. R. Ratnam, ma'am, who is the assistant professor in the IT department, to introduce the speaker of the day. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, I welcome you, sir, Dr. K. Venkatraman. Uh, sir is a seasoned IT executive yeah, with more than a decade now. of rich experience spanning across a multitude yes. of domains, technologies, and geographies. Uh, Dr. K. So Venkatraman is a highly collaborative strategic change agent with a proven track record in creating and leading high performance cross functional teams. Uh, sir has what delivered knows? innovative and disruptive solutions to customers to achieve top tier revenue and market share expansion and mentor with a proven expertise in global delivery management. Portrait looks like you have the off state, which is stable, but the region of attraction, right? is limited. There's another attracting state, okay, which is this pulsing state here, right? So G and I just oscillate periodically around this circle. And there's also the a lazing state, which is also stable. And there's a saddle type stability of the other lazing state. So you can start to see that these um, dynamical behaviors become very complicated, right? But what you can say is that wherever you are in region five, the output is going to look the same. There will be pulsing solutions, right, along with an off state um, and a CW thing, all coexisting. 
Um, you can do a bit better than the sort of hand waving plots we drew before, right? So again, this is just the same nine regions in phase space, um, but we've drawn some sample trajectories, right? So again, in region nine, remember the off state is unstable, the on state is stable. So ma no matter where you go, you always end up at the on state, right? The other one we looked at, okay, was region five, right? And the blue line here shows you the stable pulsing solution, right? Um, and again, you have the off state, and again, you have an unstable pulsing solution in red, okay? Um, and this is sort of showing you the typical dynamics. And the fact that these lasers are pulsing means that we can use this model to describe passively Q-switched fiber lasers. So this was work um, based around a paper from 2010 of a very simple um, Q-switch fiber laser where we have a section of erbium dope fiber providing gain. We have a section of thulium dope fiber providing your saturable or loss. And we have two mirrors um, making the laser cavity, right? They're just fiber brag gratings. One has a reflectivity of 99%. The other has a reflectivity of 20%, all right? And the two parameters we can change, right, are the pump power. So we're going to be pumping the erbium dope fiber um, with a 976 nanometer diode. And we're also going to change the length of the thulium dope fiber. So um, we made 10 different lengths, ranging from 0.2 to 1.5 meters. And we can just splice those into the cavity and compare how it works. So Thulium, how it works as a um, Q switcher, right? We have here in green the emission cross section for erbium, right? So you can see the strong peak at 1530. Um, our fiber brag grating is operating at about 1560. And this um, purple line is the absorption spectrum of Thulium, right? And at 1560, it's got a relatively strong absorption but it's possible to saturate it, right? It's acting like a two-level system. So the more you, more atoms you put into the excited state in thulium, the less the, lot, the, the loss will drop down and you'll saturate the loss. So this is the, again, um, work we did. So this is Robert's work and Bruno, right? So these are the experimental time traces, typical ones we found, right? You can see that our laser spontaneously starts pulsing, right? When you pump it hard enough, right? This pulsing can very quickly become chaotic, which is shown in figure A2. Um, alternatively, it can pulse, in a, but in a very different regime. So here the period, is very much longer um, than it is in period A1. So it's still a nice stable pulsing, um, but with a much longer period. And again, that can become unstable as well. And shown um, on the right are some time traces from the solving the Yamada model, right? And again, you can see there's a reasonably good agreement between the theoretical um, and experimental results. So again, you can see the two characteristically different ways um, of pulsing, very short periods or long periods, right? And there's more details about our results in this optics letter. And what that means is that we can then um, compare our biofication diagram between both the theory and the experiments, right? Um, and shown here are our experimental bifurcation diagrams. So again, region one is the off state, right? So that's non-lasing. Region two is where we get Q switching. Um, and region three is where we start seeing chaotic pulsing. All right. Um, and again, 
what we find is there's two different ways to start pulsing. You can either, either go through what we call a homoclinic bifurcation in blue, or you can do it by a Hoff bifurcation in red for low, short absorber length. And if you compare that to the theoretical bifurcation, again, we see the same sort of characteristic um, switching, right? That you have the off state here, and then you have a Hoff homoclinic bifurcation in blue, and you have a Hoff bifurcation down here. So we get very nice agreement in this regime. Um, just very briefly, there are some character times when we don't um, get good agreement. And in particular, our fiber laser experiences quite a bit of hysteresis. So when we rank the pump current up, we get a different behavior from when we rank the pump current down. And that's sort of shown um, quite well here in these diagrams. Um, and I just want to highlight this because hysteresis um, does not occur in the Yamada model. So although we use the Yamada model, we are aware that in some cases it fails. So the next um, aspect of the Yamada model I want to talk about is what's called excitability. And this is a property where in response to a small perturbation, a system can undergo a very large um, response, right? So we characterize it as an all or non response to a stimulus, right? Um, and this is of interest because it occurs in a lot of um, practical situations, in, in particular like neurons, right? So, you know, for a neuron, right, if you give a neuron a small stimulus, it doesn't do anything, right? But if you go above a certain threshold, the neuron will emit a um, pulse, a spike, right? And so if we can try and understand the dynamical behavior of neurons, then we can start to think about making um, what we call photonic computers, right? Um, especially photonic reservoir computing. And we can get a better understanding of the dynamics of neurons. And again, People have studied the um, neural behavior in terms of the Yamada model. And again, you find quite a nice agreement. So the Yamada model is quite ubiquitous. And here are just some um, pictures, okay, of what sort of happens and we, in different ways. Um, but for our system, we have this sort of phase space trajectory here, right? So again, Remember, O is the off state, right, which is our stable system, right? And then we have this saddle node here, right? And Q is the lazing state. So now we ask what happens if we perturb the off state, right? And if you imagine following this purple trajectory, right? So we're going to kick the off state to this point here, right? Um, and then it's just going to very rapidly decay back to the off state. So we call this a sub-threshold perturbation. On the other hand, if I kick my system, so the perturbation, rather than ending up here, ends up on the other side of this, what we call the um, unstable manifold, right? Then the perturbation, right? The system still wants to relax to the off state, because that's the only stable state of our system, but it can't cross these manifolds, right? If you're in phase space, trajectories can't cross. So the only way the system can return back to the off state is by following this green line here, right? And you can see that it's going to go out to a much higher intensity value, right? Before returning to the off state. Um, and again, there's a sort of a slightly more accurate picture in um, G, Q, and I, where again, this threshold, this manifold here separates the two trajectories. And so the trajectory for the above threshold has to go all the way up here over the manifold and then come back down. And so you would expect to see a very large response 
very large spike in intensity. Um, so again, we did that, right? So we perturb our system um, with 980 nanometer diode, okay? Um, shown here, see amplitude of the perturbation, right below threshold, it's about 0.2. Above threshold, it's about 0.3. And on this scale, if you're below the threshold, you can't see the response of the system. If you're above the threshold, right, we've made a tiny change to the perturbation strength, but the output intensity of the laser has increased sort of, you know, by a factor of about 10,000 or so. So it's a really, this is what we mean by spiking behavior. So this is a theory. Um, and these are our experimental responses. Like, so again, right, um, below threshold, you just see noise. You don't see any um, interesting dynamical behavior, All right? Above threshold, right? Again, notice the power's gone from, you know, a few, you know, tens of milliwatts up to about six or so watts. So again, you get this sort of thousand fold increase in intensity for a very small increase in perturbation. The other characteristic behavior um, of the excitable response is that as your threshold gets, as your perturbation goes up in strength, the length of time it should take um, to exhibit, to recover, should get shorter and shorter, right? And you can think about that. The perturbations go up in strength. You're starting further and further around this curve. And so everything's going to happen quicker, all right? So the response time speeds up. And this, again, we have the theory here. We have the experiment here. And again, you see a very nice agreement, okay? so. The higher the perturbation, the quicker the system responds. So that was the um, first set of experiments we did looking um, at the Yamada model. The other next set of experiments I want to talk about uh, were ones done in Paris by Sylvain Barbet and his co-workers, right? Um, and again, here now they have a semiconductor laser, all right? Um, it's a VIXEL, so it's, it's a vertical cavity mixing semiconductor laser. Um, and again, you have saturable absorbers here. You have a gain section, right? So it's exactly the same. And then you have some fiber Bragg gratings. So conceptually, it's the same as the fiber laser, only it's sort of, you know, a few, 100 microns um, in length, rather than about sort of five or six meters. So it's just much smaller. And the big difference here is that we add in feedback to our system. So when the laser emits a pulse, right, it goes out through here, goes through the beam splitter to the photo detector, and half of it goes onto the lens, it gets focused onto this mirror, and it goes back in, right? And what this does, right, is it gives you a second input response, right? So a single perturbation, if it's excitable, will cause a single pulse. That pulse will go into the mirror, come back, perturb the system again, and emit another excitable pulse, right? And so on. So you can see now that this additional feedback provides some memory and it should turn a single excitable response um, into a periodic pulse train. Um, so these were um, just some very experimental results, just showing again the same threshold um, response for excitable and just demonstrating again that um, the we're clearly in the excitable regime here, right? So as you increase the threshold, the excitable response happens quicker and it happens stronger. So these are some pulse train um, traces from Sylvain's group, right? Um, and we've got two different ways of showing them, right? One is just a simple time trace. 
And the other one is what we call sort of a space time plot, right? So we take this time trace here and we split it up into length of the decay time, of the feedback time, 4.88 nanoseconds, right? So tau goes along here, a number of round trip goes up here, right? And what we see is that there's one pulse in the cavity at any one time, right? And this pulse um, moves at an offset velocity, and that's due to the latency time, right? Because our semiconductor laser takes some time to respond. So after the pulse comes back into the laser, there's a delay before the pulse is re-emitted, and that causes this angular response here, right? And the noticeable thing here is that although theoretically um, our pulse train should last forever, we find that after some time um, it dies away. And the other interesting thing we found was that no matter how long we waited, we would never see the spontaneous um, emission of a pulse unless we actually perturbed it. So these were just some statistics. OK, um, for different pump levels, right, showing you how quickly the pulse would um, die away. Um, as you increase the pump, right, the pulse will last for longer and longer. And you can plot, you can plot those and they follow a nice straight line if you plot the log of that. Um, and that corresponds to what's known as Kramer's law, right? And this tells you how often you might expect a um, particle to escape a potential well if there's just thermal fluctuations, right? So if there's just sort of some Gaussian noise in your system, then you can work out quite easily um, how long you expect to have to wait before your Gaussian fluctuation is bigger than the size of the potential well. All right, and that gives you a similar straight line relationship. So again, our model is described um, quite well by just the Kramer's, Kramer's law, which suggests we need to be adding some noise into the Yamada model. So here's our Yamada model again. Um, so again, we have G, Q, and I but we have some additional terms, right? So we're assuming there's some perturbation to the gain, right? Um, you know, this is just a small fluctuation, right? The formula for the intensity is quite different. So first of all, there's our feedback term um, given by kappa, right? And it's a delayed feedback. We now have some spontaneous emission, all right? Um, as well as a driving noise term F. And this introduction of the feedback um, actually introduces a whole new range of interesting dynamics, right? Um, because we now have a delay differential equation, which means we've gone from a three dimensional set of nonlinear equations to essentially an infinite dimensional phase space. Um, but we can still do the same sort of bifurcation analysis, right? Only now we're looking at the bifurcation in the kappa tau plane, right? So we have kappa up here, tau here. And again, we can see the same regions we had before. So again, you know, you have nine is the stable lazing state, two is the off state. Um, we have six, seven, and eight are the various lazing states. Um, so again, this is the other way, right? We have gain and intensity, right? We have the three CW pulsing states we had before. And again, in region two, the only stable state is the off state. If you go up to region six, you find a nice pulsing solution. So with feedback, right, you still get stable pulsing solutions. Um, region seven is very similar, right? 
except that the off state is unstable. So no matter where you start, you're going to end up in the stable pulsing solution. Um, region eight, right? We find multiple pulsing solutions <coughs> um, as well as a stable CW solution. Um, this is just a small fraction of the wide range of dynamical behavior, um, which I'm not going to talk too much about, right? Um, but you have to go out to very large values of tau because experimentally the decay is about, the delay time is about 2000 or not. So it becomes quite a complicated system. We also find the existence of chaotic solutions. Um, where we find solutions, a torus bifurcation um, shown here, where you see our solutions um, move around essentially on a torus in three dimensions, right? Um, and because the two periods are non-commensurable, you get um, quasi-periodic behavior. You also can find multiple um, stable pulsing solutions in the system. And again, more details can be found in this paper um, written by Sajik and ourselves um, a few years ago. So we're going to try and compare with experiments. So we're going to fit the feedback at 0.04. So 4% of the light is coupled back into the laser cavity um, after quite a long decay, right? And in that case, we find there's one stable pulsing solution, right, and the stable off state. So this is what the pulsing solution looks like as before. Um, and again, we find this really nice agreement between um, experiments and simulations. So again, we're doing this um, space time plot. So here's our one pulse in the cavity corresponding to one pulse in the simulations. You can find multiple pulses in the cavity. Again, um, we see those in the simulations. Um, so that's when there were two pulses in the cavity at any one time. You can have three pulses in the cavity at any one time. And again, we get very good agreement with the thing, with the simulations. Um, similarly, when we add noise, right, again, we see that the effect of the noise is to kill off our pulse, pulse train. Okay, um, and again, we get some nice agreement with the experiments. Um, we can also show that the per size of the perturbation needed to switch the laser to the on state is always higher than the size of the perturbation needed to switch the laser to the off state. And again, that agrees well with the experimental observation, right? Um, that we never saw the laser spontaneously switch on, but we often saw it um, spontaneously switch off. And the other thing you can see that as time increases, the perturbation you need to turn the laser off gets smaller and smaller. Um, and so at some point it's going to become lower than the noise level. So that was one model we've been looking at. Um, the other mod next model I want to talk briefly about is um, a model of coupled ring resonators, where here we have two waves in our ring resonator, one going clockwise around the ring, one going counterclockwise around the ring, okay? Um, and these were experiments done um, by a group in um, Glasgow, right? Um, and we've been um, trying to model their experiments because um, they're really fun experiments. And so they have this system and they see a variety of interesting behaviors, right? Um, published most recently in PRL just this year where they start to see, again, pulsing and chaotic behavior. They also see hysteresis in their system um, and they see symmetry breaking. 
So there's three features we need to be able to explain. Hysteresis, symmetry breaking, <coughs> and chaotic switching. So the model we've been looking at, um, again, is a relatively simple one. We have two electric fields, E1 and E2. E1 represents the amplitude of the field going clockwise. E2 is the complex amplitude of the field going counterclockwise. And these fields are driven by a pump F. Um, and then there's loss in the fiber, right? So we've normalized the time so that the loss is one, right? There's detuning from the cavity resonance given by delta, right? And then there's self phase modulation and cross phase modulation that are um, due to the Kerr effect in silica fibers. So it's the fact that the nonlinearity changes the intensity, sorry, changes the refractive index. Um, so large intensities see a larger refractive index than smaller ones. So our goal at the moment is to ana analyze these experiment, these equations. Um, and again, we find a wide range of interesting behavior. So shown here, first thing that appears is the optical hysteresis. So we have two parameters, P, which is the size of the driving field, and delta is the detuning, right? So we have optical hysteresis in this region. We have symmetry breaking in this purple region. Um, we have periodic and chaotic oscillations in the green region. And we also have hysteresis um, and asymmetry, um, steady, steady state breaking in this region here. So it's a very complicated phase diagram. So to try and understand that, we're just going to take a few points in the diagram. And again, sorry, my region is switching and talk about what's going on. So region one, okay, is the region of period, nice periodic switching. So that's shown here, right? You have um, periodic oscillations in the clockwise and counterclockwise fields, right? So you can either look at them as a function of time, or you can look at them as in phase space. So this is just the amplitude of P1 along one axis, sorry, and the amplitude of P2 along the other. So nice um, regular trajectories here. If you move into region two, right, then you start to see you go through across a period doubling oscillation, right? And so these simple trajectories, it takes two loops round before you get back to where you started from. So it's a period three. If from go from period two to period three, you increase the um, pump a bit further, then you start to see chaotic oscillation. So you, you do multiple um, bits of period doubling, and you this is the classical period doubling route to chaos that should be familiar um, to many of you. Um, the other thing we can split it up, sorry, is region four here, okay, where now you start to see very large swings in amplitude, right? So the amplitude in one of the fields can drop almost to zero. And that can happen in either a regular, right, a periodic switching or a quasi-periodic switching behavior. All right. Um, if you cross, oh, sorry. If you cross the Beklodov transition, which is this dashed line here, you become um, chaotic, right? Um, and you start to see um, also see homoclinic solutions here, right? And this boundary is the homoclinic orbit. So these are solutions that take an infinite amount of time to go from one 
CW solution to another. So this time here just shows a very small thing, right? And it actually goes um, asymptotically for minus infinity and plus infinity, these solutions converge to the stable point here, right? Um, and there's multiple homoclinic orbits, right? Where you can take one trajectory, one oscillation, three pulses, four pulses, and so on. And you can have multiple switching between them. You can also get homoclinic um, orbits, right? So these are solutions that start for t equals minus infinity at one solution, and then they take an infinite amount of time to reach a second solution. So that you can think of them as kink solutions. And again, they behave, um, become exceedingly complicated, right? Um, so every time they cross, you get a new family of solutions. Um, and in this tiny region here, you actually get infinitely many of these heteroclinic orbits. Um, and again, our PhD student Rodriguez is actively involved in trying to calculate these and trying to understand their behavior. The last region um, talked about is region six here, right? Where you get um, chaotic switching and that corresponds very closely to what the experimentalists observed um, and they published um, just this year. So this chaotic switching where all of the light goes from being in one mode to being in the other mode very quickly. So the last model I want to talk about um, are passively coupled resonators. So these describe photonic crystal cavities. So shown here is an SEM, right? Um, again, these was experimental work done in Paris, right? Um, so they make these photonic crystal cavities. So you can see here, you have one cavity on the left, you have a second identical cavity on the right. Um, along the middle here, we have a waveguide where these um, holes are slightly smaller. So we shine light into our photonic crystal waveguide and we get linear coupling from the waveguide to either of these cavities. Um, and inside the cavity, they build up light and you start to see um, a nonlinear response. So again, as before, right, um, they observed hysteresis. So if you go up in power, all of a sudden you jump up to an excited state. You can stay there for a bit. And if you decrease the pump power, you come back along a different trajectory. And at some point you drop back down to the off state. If you increase the power a bit more, you start to see these sort of, again, characteristic um, switching, pulsing behavior, all right? So again, we have to find symmetry breaking and pulsing. And one of the real reasons why these cavities are interesting is that they're very small, which means that all these nonlinear effects happen with typically less than about 100 photons, right? So we're starting to get to the regime of doing a few photon nonlinear optics, right? And so one of the things we're particularly interested in studying is how does this interface between classical and quantum behavior um, change when you start to introduce a nonlinearity. So are there signs of, you know, quantum mechanics that we can see in this system, or does it behave completely classically? So first thing we need is a model for it. Um, and this is our model. It's very similar to the other model for the passive re coupled ring resonators. So A and B are the classical amplitudes um, of light. Okay, the complex numbers in each field. And again, 
Here now we have our nonlinearity, right, which is again the Kerr term. Again, we have our loss, right? So again, we normalize the time so that the loss is one, right? We again have some linear coupling. So in the last system, we looked at nonlinear coupling between the two fields. Now our coupling is just linear, right? And we have a driving term F as before. So what's nice about this is we can now try and isolate the effects um, of linear coupling compared to nonlinear coupling in our system. Um, and the other thing with the experiments, there's two parameters we can very easily change. First of all is the detuning, right, delta from the resonance, right? And you can change that very easily just by changing the um, amplitude of your pump field, sorry, the frequency of your pump diode. And you can also change the amplitude of the pump, right? So you can vary the amplitude and you can vary the frequency very easily. <laughs> so we take those two systems and we did a bifurcation analysis. And the first thing that you find is what we call a pair of saddle node bifurcations. So this is the output from the system theoretically as a function of the input. And again, you see this multi-stability behavior. So for a pump power of four, there are three possible solutions. The one in the middle is unstable. So you have a low power and a high power solution. And again, that's what you see in the experiment. It says, you know, a low power solution and a high power solution. These states um, then become unstable through what's called a pitchfork bifurcation. And this gives you the symmetry breaking, right? So you start off with a symmetric solution um, at the symmetry breaking point, then all of the light either goes, starts going to cavity A or into cavity B, right? Um, and again, that explains the experimental results. As you increase the pump power still further, so F here is increasing, right? It's now up around 11. We start to see again the Hoff bifurcation, which is where we start to see the oscillations, right? So we create a stable periodic solution. And again, that's what you see experimental. So we can put um, all of those solutions together, right? Um, and this shows you again a one parameter um, bifurcation diagram. So along here is the pump current. Along this axis is just showing you the output. Um, and again, you see you start off um, with one solution, you go undergo through here, and you get multiple solutions. You then increase the pump current. Again, you get the pitchfork, which is where you get the symmetry breaking. So if you go up to the upper state, you get a Hoff bifurcation um, and you get a whole load of increasingly complicated trajectories, which we can zoom in on. Um, again, shown here, right? You have the Hoff, you know, PD here represents period doubling, right? So again, um, you start to see this period two, period four, it folds back on itself, you get a period eight, you start to see multiple period doubling. Um, and eventually, you get what's known as the Chernikov bifurcation. Um, and the presence of this Chernikov bifurcation um, means that we can prove theoretically that we should see um, chaotic dynamics in our system. Um, and so this is just a sample output trace. Again, it's a theoretical one. Um, so it's not something that's been observed experimentally yet. Um, and you can start to see here what the chaotic attractor looks like in phase space. So it's a really nice looking object, okay? Um, and here's our time series. So you can see that you get these um, chaotic oscillations where at some, some time most of the light is in cavity A, other times most of the light is in cavity B, um, and it switches back 
rained and leaked. Um, if this next slide is, sorry, seems to take a time to show up. It will turn up here eventually. Yeah, so again, we can now look at what happens if we start changing the detuning, right? So remember, the detuning is the other parameter we can easily vary experimentally, right? Because it just sort of corresponds to sort of like 100 kilohertz shift in the laser. Um, and you can start to see as the detuning goes from minus one up to minus five, right? The dynamics become increasingly complicated, right? For low value for the tuning, the only bifurcation you get is again the pitchfork bifurcation, right? Where you get the symmetry breaking for a certain parameter regime, right? Um, this symmetry breaking becomes an error of multi stability. Um, at some point, for delta equals minus four, you start to see the emergence of Hoff bifurcations, right? Um, these Hoff bifurcations um, at, you know, for delta equals minus five are increasingly complicated, right? And you start to see the period doubling oscillations we talked about and the emergence of the Chernigov bifurcation, this Hom point here. Um, and again, everything becomes more and more complicated um, as you increase the detuning. The other way of trying to understand all of that is to put them all in a single diagram, <coughs> um, which I admit um, is very complicated and a bit hard to understand. But again, you can start to see this curve P here is the pitchfork. And again, you see that for low values of delta, right, the, as you increase F, there's only the pitchfork bifurcation. The next bifurcation that turns up, right, is the um, multi stability and given by the cast point here, right? Similarly, H represents where we find the Hoff bifurcation. So that's the periodic dynamics. Um, and down here, where all these lines tend to merge, is where you start to see the chaotic behavior. So um, that's about my time. So conclusions, what I've hoped to try and tell you is that the dynamical systems approach is a very powerful tool, right? Um, and we can use it to um, analyze very different numerical um, experimental things. So from fibers, right, fiber lasers that might be 10 meters long, right, down to photonic crystals, right, which are sort of nanometer size, right? And we can still find the same sort of dynamical behavior, right? We still see Hoff bifurcations, we see period doubling, we see chaotic behavior, and we can understand all of those using the same tools, right? Um, and we can also extend that to things like neurons, so the Yamada model, which we use to describe semiconductor lasers, other people use to describe um, neurons, neurons and you know the behavior in the brain so i hope i've um, persuaded you to adopt or at least to consider um bifurcation analysis um in that and again as i started i want to finish by thanking the people <coughs> um who's done most of the work um in particular i do have to acknowledge that the experimental work was all done um by colleagues in Paris, right, the semiconductor work, whereas Robert did the experimental work on the fibers. So now I'm happy to take any questions um, if people have any. Yeah, uh, very, uh, thank you, Dr. Neil, uh, for uh, presenting a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, I'm really thankful to you. Yeah. Dr. Neil, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank questions? you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.
संजू मैम डॉक्टर संजू मैम बीना मैम यस सर यस यस मैम सर पार्टिसिपेंट्स कैन इंटरेक्ट विद द स्पीकर पार्टिसिपेंट्स इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेरी यू कैन आस द स्पीकर या शीला रानी मैम प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ शीला रानी मैम कैन अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ एंड आस्क द डाउट participants you can interact with a resource person it looks like from the chat that you have to unmute them so they can talk yeah just a minute just a minute is participants you can ask your doubt or you can always type a question in the chat and i can have a look participants so you can type the uh, your questions in the chat box please dear participants now you are mute your mic is unmuted you can unmute and you can ask your doubt to our resource person or you can post your doubts in the chat box professor this is a really a nice presentation professor scintillating talk we are, uh, we thank you very much for your presentation uh, i think we are blessed to hear your presentation thank you professor all right thank you <coughs> thank you thank you so much uh, now i request dr t beena assistant professor department of physics to propose vote of thanks ma'am madam one minute yes. excellent presentation dr neel okay. i am sudha Oh, thanks thanks for the invite so yeah 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 thank you sir good uh, good afternoon to all it is my privilege to propose vote of thanks for the fifth day session 6 of two week international faculty development program on advanced computational and experimental research in physics 2021 organized by department of physics srmist ramaburam chennai First of all, I extend my sincere thanks to our chairman for his encouragement and support to conduct this two-week FTP. I extend my warm thanks to Dr. Neil Broderick, Professor, Department of Physics, University of Auckland, New Zealand, who gave a scintillating talk on nonlinear dynamics in coupled optical resonator. So really, he has inspired us a lot. I extend my sincere thanks to our director Ramaburam and Trichy campus for the perfect support and guidance extended to us for conducting this FTP. My sincere thanks to our dean ENG Ramaburam campus for his valuable support. I thank our vice principal academic vice principal admin for for their encouragement for this to conduct this FTP. I thank all the faculty members research scholars for their continuous support. Last but not least, I am very much thankful to all the participants who have attended this uh, today's session. Thank you all. Dear participants, feedback link has been posted in the chat box. Kindly use it. Uh. Okay, so if there's no questions, I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Good. Goodbye, Dr. Neil. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks a lot. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Bye.
Ma'am. Sanju, ma'am, don't admit anybody. Dear participants, there is a kind announcement. Um, before, the, after the session, starting of every session, after 10 minutes, we will lock the room. And after the posting of feedback link, 10 minutes after the posting of feedback link, we will close the Zoom meet. This is for your kind information, dear participants.
that's all the same same thing so slash n will come to the next line slash t will give a tab space in the same line the other things are all same okay so similarly here also similarly here also if it is inside this array also how i will write it so tell me the syntax what i should write here so instead of scan f so what i will write tell me tell me i am waiting to type no scan f this is so it should be c in c in okay then i am asking it as array of i so that means it's an array so same thing i will say array as usual this uh, square brackets for arrays so array of i so no need for that uh, this uh, this symbol ampersand symbol this percentage is nothing so the di direct i will give like this okay so here how i will write print f enter the value to find so how i will write in c++ see out the same thing enter the value to type to find so i will write all those things okay then i will say slash n to come to the next line then that's all clear with the syntax yes or no yes or no are you clear with the little bit syntax of c++ how to write so in step but here you should give instead of this stdio.h you should give input output string io string dot h header file Okay, so this is what you will give in the first line. Then only it will work, and you need to run it in online uh, C++ compiler. In this compiler, it won't work. This is C, so you have to search for online C++ compiler. There also online GDB is available for C++. You can run there. Whereas in college, there is no problem. That was it. Okay, the rest of the syntax are same. You try writing the same code in C++. You execute, it will come beautiful. Okay, so then you write it as a uh, low. You say initially the first element will be zero, no? Initially in the search element the high will be n minus one. That means that means what? So let me go to this diagram. Then it is easy. The initially low should be here, correct? High should be here. So that then only you can find the mid element. Yes or no? How did you find this? Zero plus nine by two. That is how you found, no? So zero. So low is zero. High is nine. Here you said nine because you had ten, but here you don't know, so you will say n minus one. Correct up to this. This logic is clear. Yes or no? Yes or no? Ah, then you have to find middle element is equal to low plus high by two. Okay, so then note the point here. You have given this as integer. so it will not round off see if you have 4.5 if it is float means it will give same so it is integer so it will round off and it will give 4 so that is how we are calculating then what you are doing here so you are just comparing so why uh, low is less than or equal to high so because if this element and this element are same that is that if low is equal to high means you cannot proceed at all so see like this example low is equal to high here no that means there is only element available so you cannot proceed from that right so that is how you can change so that comparison so that loop you have to have so while this is the condition you start searching for the mid element you just to compare it with the key element so mid element is less than key means what you will do increment the low so that means you come back to this figure then it will be easy so you are just comparing mid element with the key element okay so read that line again so this particular line array of mid less than key so you are just comparing the key with the middle element okay so you go back here so you are just comparing let me go to the first step okay you are comparing the key with the middle element so here in this case what happens so this is less than that so you are uh, uh, changing the value of high here mid minus 1 am i correct so initially low was here high was here mid is here now your search element is less than middle element so low continues to be the same high is mid minus 1 am i correct yes or no the logic you understand the logic so if in this case you assume it is falling in this part okay then what i will do so this is low this is high this is mid so search element is greater than the middle element so that means the high will continue to be the same but low will change to be change to be low will change to be what you continue here 
see i will repeat again so this is low this is high this is mid okay now my search element is greater than the mid element so it is somewhere here you are assume okay it is somewhere here so if my search element is greater than the mid element then what happens high will be the same no change whereas low will change to you complete this part low will change to where low will change to where low will change to where see that and say are you all following or not or are you all traveling give some reply you understand this logic or not so if the you see if this one is greater if the search element is greater than the middle element naturally your low element should be middle plus 1 no so either your low should be middle plus 1 or high should be middle minus 1 this is what the change you need to do there. correct no so you are now changing it low is equal to middle plus 1 So otherwise, you are just comparing whether the middle element is equal to the key element, which it is found. You stop the process there, so you give break and stop the process. Otherwise, what happens? You have to change the position of the high. So means that means what? You are changing the position of the high. So it comes here. So if it is in this area, first half, then this this part you are going to eliminate. So your low continues to be the same, whereas high should be. mid minus 1 so high should be mid minus 1 that is what we have given okay so like this the process will continue the entire thing has to be in the loop okay this process will continue again and again so finally if the algorithm itself is over then you say this is not available in the list okay any doubt so far any doubt so far in binary search yes or no bye Okay. Only one thing you say after this. So this statement of printf, you just tell me how to write in C plus plus. Printf not found percentage t. Ah, uh, see the entire statement you say C out. This operator exertion operator. So this is called exertion operator. This is called what is that C in? This is called insertion operator. Insertion operator, exertion operator. Okay. C out, exertion operator. Then what I will give? the same thing i want in c++ so how i will give not found okay so same thing let me write okay then that percentage d is coming so that but we don't have that syntax in c++ so i will have one more exertion operator in that place what i want it what i want to come so that key element should come there so key okay without that uh, quotes if i give quotes it will be displayed as okay then this one then again Thanks. there is some continuation here isn't madhyam one time check panni paakra kila present in the list present in the list i will type this and that is over if i want for decoration spacing and all i can use slash in slash in once it is over don't forget to end the line with a semicolon so here if you give that it will be so here as then and there you can give space so that it will look neat any doubt so far any doubts that is it with binary search and linear search so now let us come so many windows are open now let us come here to this way. let me close this let us go to your lab कोडिंग लॉजिक don't go to that uh, thing and search a c++ program and copy the same take this program okay uh, rewrite this program in c++ now you know where to change almost most of the syntax is same it will be changed only so change all the syntax okay change all the syntax have it saved somewhere okay follow all these things go to this uh, google search online c++ compiler open that uh, gd uh, gdb so means i will just show that here i don't so c++ compiler okay this first one you take that is online gdb is giving quicker reply so here 
to uh, cut all these things available. Already this code is there in C. Rewrite that in C++. Okay, copy that, paste it here. Take a screenshot of it. Okay, after that you give run. You will get the output here. Take a screenshot of it. Okay, open one beautiful one empty word. Okay, create the name. So like open the word. So you think it is taking time. In this. Let me open one word. What you do? So this process you continue. You take time till next uh, Saturday only. The date uh, we have changed now. So go to this word. So type here date. Uh, what is the current date? You write that date. Today's date. Seventeen nine. So don't all the sixty four of you today's date. Then exercise number one. Okay, do, no need for your name and all because you are going to come anyway here. Suppose you are going to continue the same online. So you just mention in this corner, you just mention your name. Uh, like uh, your uh, it is coming here. Okay, let me just do Name is Tom. Okay, register number is 18 or what? 18 or 1, what is that? What is the number of the first uh, person? 1, register number 1. Okay, so uh, say here name, so and so. See, it is very slow here, but I think you can follow it. So name is this. So here you just write. Tap, 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 tap. So finally align it and then write register number is complete register number. Everything you write. R, A, how it will come? 220. Then what? 802. Am I correct? So I don't know that complete number. How it will come. Something. So after all these things, you give 1. R, A, 20. Yeah, yeah R, A, 20, 1, 1, 0, 0. Uh, then 802 zero, 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 001. Correct no? Correct no? So this uh, this 802 stands for Ramapuram, this stands for your batch, and this is the college code. Okay, and this is the last three digits. Okay. So I write like this, and then you write that uh, heading, you write here. Implementation of, you write that story. Implementation of uh, searching. Then this is under that you write 1A. Implement here you write. 1A in linear search, you write it. So after that, you write aim. Then you type the aim here. Then after that, you write the algorithm. So algorithm is what we saw in VLAB. Okay, step 1, step 2, step 3. That's all. Then you come to program. So you just write the pro type the program in C. Okay, type the program. No need of screenshot for the program. Output, you take a screenshot, go here. Okay, so go to this place, this part alone, you take one print screen or this uh, take print screen, go to paint, copy that print screen, but have only this output part alone. Okay, uh, like a uh, cut shot, it, take that output part alone and paste that output, the screenshot here in this part. Then finally, you say result. Thus, a C++ program is written to implement linear search and the output is verified successfully. This is the result. Okay, that's all. This in one page. Sorry, one page or one page or how much ever. Then if there is space in that page also, you leave it. Take one fresh page. Okay, so in that fresh page, what you do? So 1B. There you write binary search, something binary search. Similarly, here also follow everything. A algorithm, program, everything you type. This output, you take a screenshot of it. Finally, have the result. So that's it. So that will be the end of this. So do everything. Save this word. Okay. Save and convert it to PDF. Copy that into save it as PDF. Okay. And then you come to this GCR. Okay. Where is the GCR? You come here. Okay. In our GCR link, you directly you go. Go to this classwork. Okay. So this classwork, some assign. Don't don't paste in the screen. Everyone will be able to view what you post in the screen. Go to classwork. Already XIS1 assignment is created. Click that. So here you will have, so this is from my side, there is no option. So from your side, you will have the option to upload. Okay, so you upload so that it will come and sit in my drive. So it will increment this number. So here it will reduce, here it will increase. So like that, by next Saturday morning, I want 64 here and 0 here. 
okay you take time till next saturday morning suppose you complete before that you can upload at any point okay so no don't wait till saturday suppose you are completing it today or tomorrow also you just upload but i want the final pdf to be uploaded okay not the word pdf to be uploaded and rename that pdf file to be your register number so the name of the pdf you give like this then only i will understand okay so copy because if you take convert that it will give some default name so you just have like this so register number this exercise 1 this will be the name of the pdf yes. so this you will follow for all the 15 exercises whether you come physical also anyway you upload in the gcr so that it will like we can take a record of that finally the final uh, uh, marks for the record we can allot from that okay so this will be the format for all the 15 exercises register number hyphen exercise number so this you all the 64 to follow for all the 15 lab exercises clear with the, all these instructions this is how you will proceed to upload your record okay so if you come physical you can maintain one observation notebook you can write all these finally take a print out of that bind it and have it for the record so but if it is going to continue online so this pdf what you upload here will be the final record so and i will be noting down all these turned in for each exercise from that consolidated report i will prepare to allot mark for the record okay so this is the uh, that the updated the pdf copy will be your uh, what is that uh, record clear with all these instructions any doubt so far anywhere anyone yes or no okay so that means we assume exercise 1 is completed but from your end you take some time till next saturday to upload this is only applicable for this exercise alone from next exercise onwards so if we complete it on tuesday you need to submit on next sorry if we complete on friday you will submit it on uh, next day that is uh, saturday morning before uh, 9 o'clock so this will be there throughout okay so let us continue with that uh, till now the video was off is it just now i am noting down was the video off till now no, i am sorry i didn't note down the total number in sin okay anyway give me your attendance number 1 attendance number 1 so often you can